Erdengiz from uh, uh, Turkish Republic of Cyprus. Uh, he is going to talk about the Cyprus issue, uh, which is a long protracted issue in Europe since it's it's uh, has been going on since 1960s, uh, and uh, and it's now in the midst of uh, uh, European Union uh, problem. Sometime. Uh, actively dealt with United Nations and U.S. Congress too. So I'm not going to uh, detail of the problem. I'm just leaving it to him. He's, he's the expert. He's the representative. But briefly, uh, let me mention about his achievements. Uh, uh, his Excellency Ahmet Erdengiz served as the representative of the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus to the United States of America from 97 to 2002. In 2009, he served as the Undersecretary of the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs. He was also appointed to the Committee on Missing Persons in Cyprus as the assistant to the Turkish member. And later, he served as the TRNC representative in Brussels, Belgium. And as of April 2012, he is back in Washington as the Washington representative of the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus to the United States. So please, please join me in welcoming uh, Ambassador Erdengis. Thank you for coming all. And um, when I was asked to give a speech on this program, I was thinking uh, to talk about the latest developments in the Cyprus issue. But then I realized that um, there is nothing developing, really. There is nothing much to talk about the latest developments uh, on Cyprus issue. Um, instead, I decided not to talk about the latest developments, but go to the very first day of Cyprus issue and try to tell you uh, the Turkish Cypriot version, and then I, I underline this fact, Turkish Cypriot version uh, of the events that we believe led to the emergence of Cyprus issue and finally reasons why this issue has become protracted, irreconcilable, and even unsolvable. Um, two professors um, working on the Palestinian-Israeli issue uh, recently produced a very important work, which they called it Double Helix. In essence, in their work, they talk about that in a protracted issue, like Palestinian-Israeli issue, or like uh, Cyprus issue, in time emerges two different narratives. Very different from each other, they tell the same uh, they try to tell the same event from different perspectives, from different points of view, and trying to reconcile these two narratives is impossible. What can be done is that instead of trying to reconcile these two different narratives, people should try to listen to the narrative of each other, and at the end of the day, try to understand each other. And when I looked to their model and to their book, I saw that there are so many similarities between the Israeli-Palestinian uh, uh, question and Cyprus issue that it amazed me. Of course, historical differences and uh, um, geographical differences are there, but nevertheless, both issue still remains on the agenda of uh, war politicians throughout the world. So I would like to uh, refer to the work of uh, professors Gabriel Salomon and Daniel Bartal, who once described the intractable conflicts as those that are protracted, irreconcilable, violent, of zero-sum nature, total and central, whereas parties involved invest their major resources in such conflicts. 
The Cyprus conflict started in mid-1950s as a communal confrontation between the Greek Cypriots and Turkish Cypriots living under British colonial rule and evolved into a full-blown conflict after the collapse of the Partnership Republic of, uh, Republic of Cyprus in 1963. Since then, it has passed through many phases, but always defying a solution. After six UN Secretary Generals, nine US Presidents, and 44 years of intermittent talks, it still eludes a solution and seems as irreconcilable and intractable as ever. Why? There has certainly no lack of expertise, knowledge or skill at the negotiating table. And at requisite times, there was no shortage of international interest, assistance, and even pressure. Yet the vicious circle of failure persists. Why the basic and minimum existential needs of Turkish Cypriot people always seem to exceed the Greek Cypriots' maximum concessions. Why does the Greek Cypriot side perceive the issue as being a zero-sum nature, employed violence in the past, and has been mobilizing all its possible resources within and without Cyprus, and whenever possible international community, in order to win it? In order to answer these questions and comprehend the crux of Cyprus problem, I will take you to a journey through the pages of Cypriot history. <coughs> Our historical travel will begin sometime in September 1571 and end in March 1964, not 2012. Don't worry. After traversing almost 400 years of Cyprus's history, I hope we shall find at least some answers, perhaps not acceptable to all, and if among you there are people of Greek descent, they will object it, no doubt. But as I said at the beginning, it's a double helix where two narratives exist side by side, and I hope this will be an educational and not a confrontational speech. Although the Turks were not totally aliens to the inhabitants of medieval Cyprus, since Turkish merchants um, called on the island repeatedly, Anatolia being only 70 nautical miles away from Cyprus, and since Cyprus was a tributary to Ottoman Empire under Venetians, nevertheless, the Greek Cypriots and Turks met en masse in 1571, following the Ottoman capture of the island. For the benefit of uh, American audience, allow me to say that this was well before the pilgrims landed at Plymouth and the establishment of Jamestown colony. So it goes quite uh, back. Greek Cypriots welcomed the Ottoman on the island as savior, since almost 400 years of French and Venetian rules of Cyprus had reduced the Greek Cypriots to state of complete serfdom. As landless paupers, while they were oppressed by their feudal lords, their church, the Orthodox Church of Cyprus, was subjugated to the Catholic Church, losing its independence religious authority and economic resources. A papal edict in 1260 abolished the office of Archbishop of Cyprus. On May 6, 1572, the Ottoman Sultan Selim II sent an edict to the governors of Anatolia asking them to send Turkish population to the island in order to reestablish and rejuvenate the economy of the island. This arrangement, uh, which went on for the next 200 years, um, brought 
the Turks to the island. So their starting point is 1572. Professor Pierre Oberling, uh, in one of his works, makes the following observations. And I think it is very important to look at this observation. He says, as a result of these population transfers, Turks from wide variety of professional backgrounds made their way to the island. In this respect, the process of colonization carried out by the Ottomans in Cyprus was similar to that of British in North America. But an important difference was that the Turks made a wholehearted effort to integrate the local inhabitants into the economic and political life of the Ottoman Empire while allowing them to retain their own social institutions, cultural identity. Whereas in the New World, the Indians were simply pushed aside as impediments to the fulfillment of white men's dreams. Finally, uh, Professor Oberling says, it is worth noting that the Ottoman government never attempted to establish a Turkish majority on Cyprus, nor did it seek to set up an economically dominant upper class. Under the Turkish rule, Greek Cypriots controlled the island's principal business enterprises, especially those concerned with trade. Thus begin, began the common history of Turkish Cypriots and Greek Cypriots. Common, yet distinct. Let us pause and recapitulate. As of third quarter of 16th century, Cyprus now had two major distinct populations. Greek Cypriots, who claimed to be remnants of the ancient Greeks, spoke Greek and belonged to the Orthodox Church, and the Turkish Cypriots, offshoots of Turkomans of Anatolia, who spoke Turkish and mainly belonged to the Alevite sect of Islam in rural areas and Sunni sect of Islam in urban areas. While in towns, each community lived in its separate quarters in rural areas, two different types of settlements emerged in time. In most cases, Greek and Turkish Cypriots lived in ethnically homogeneous villages, and in some cases, ethnically mixed villages. Yet even in the mixed villages, Greek Cypriots and Turkish Cypriots lived in their distinct areas. In his article, Turks and Greeks of Cyprus, Psychopolitical Considerations, eminent professor of psychiatry, Vamuk Volkan, summarizes the relationship between the two peoples of the island under Ottoman and British rule, roughly encompassing 300 years. He says, and I quote, under the Ottomans and British, an external power controlled the two communities so that they could do nothing but to live together. And outside of a few incidents, the two communities shared the island in a seemingly peaceful fashion. Consequently, what was established over the centuries was a Cypriot culture based on two communities and therefore a psychological duality. The Turks and Greeks intermingled physically, but their major differences of religion and language protected respective identities. In order to further protect uh, their identities, however, this dual culture also sanctioned certain rituals. For example, intermarrying between the two groups became a taboo as severe as incest. And, end of quote. And one can add to this observation that uh, separate economic structures remained on the island. And this is a very striking and telling fact. Between 1572 to 1974, history of Cyprus records no joint economic venture whatsoever. Among the members of two communities, Turkish Cypriot and Greek Cypriot capital, only intermingled in the coffers of Barclays Bank established by the British on the island in 1940s. 
As indicated by Professor Volkan, under the protective umbrella of the Ottomans and then the British, two peoples lived in peace. And as in any multicultural society and geographical region, Greek Cypriots and Turkish Cypriots participated in each other's social events, such as weddings, funerals, and festivities. They worked as hired laborers for each other and traded in local village market. Yet Cyprus proved to be no melting pot. Nearly 450 years of coexistence on a small island did not produce a nation. When it came to integration and nation building, Cyprus was certainly not United States of America. In other words, there exists no Cypriot nation, no Cypriot language, no Cypriot religion. In the infamous but true words of former Greek Cypriot leader, Archbishop Makarios, only the donkeys of Cyprus can be called real Cypriots, he said. Rest are Greeks and Turks. For the next 250 years, Cyprus remained basically peaceful and the relationship between the two peoples undisturbed. However, with the arrival of nationalism in Greece at the end of 18th and the beginning of 19th century, through Greek merchants, philhellenic movements in Europe, things started to change. The fate of Cyprus, thousands of miles away from Greek mainland, was about to change. Nationalism rapidly caught on the Greek provinces of Ottoman Empire, which culminated by, uh, in the Greek uh, revolt of 1821. And finally, Ottomans were forced to grant independence uh, to Greece. However, what started as liberal nationalism and philhellenic ideals soon transformed itself into a ruthless version of nationalism. In Greece, tens of thousands of Turks were massacred in few months, and they disappeared. In his monumental treatise, one of the best sources of Greek War of Independence, the Greek historian Spiridon Trikupis <coughs> describes the events. The day of the seizure of the Peloponnesian capital was the day of destruction, fire, pillage, and blood. Men, women, children all perished, some with their throats cut, some thrown into the flames. These sins lasted for three days, and on the third day, those who had fled the city were slaughtered in the countryside. And these dis descriptions go on and on. The reason why I am quoting is not um, to show that Greeks or this or that is more violent and more barbaric, but simply the transformation of Greek nationalist movement, which started as a liberal nationalist, uh, nationalist movement, in few years turned into another version. It was unfortunately this fierce and violence-laden version of Greek nationalism and the na not the nationalism of westernized Greek intellectuals and European philhellens exported to Cyprus. Dreams to reestablish the former glory of ancient Greece was soon forgotten thanks to Greek Orthodox Church and nationalist agenda was redrafted to recreate Orthodox Byzantine. Pierre Oberling in his monography, The Double Representation Conspiracy, summarizes this transformation as follows. As the heady wine of religious passion mixed with the already intoxicating nectar of political nationalism, it became inevitable that the Greek war of independence would turn into a religious crusade. Uh, and then he quotes Professor Denis Iskitiotis of Harvard University, which he says, unfortunately, the events that followed. With savage jubilance, the Greeks sang the words, let no Turk remain in the Morea nor in the world. The Greeks were determined to achieve Romaic, that is Byzantine restoration, in the only way they knew how, through a war of religious extermination, end of quote. 
The political analyst Harry Anastasio in his two volume work, The Broken Olive Branch, makes the following observations as regards the historically untenable Romaic, that is Byzantine version of Greek nationalism, which still dominates the general ideology of the Greek Orthodox Church of Cyprus. And I quote, yet any serious inquiry reveals that the concept of Greek nation, let alone of Greek nation state, was completely absent from the Byzantine Empire. Historically, the leaders and populace of the Byzantine Empire saw their world as a continuation of the ideal of imperial Rome, to which institutionalized Christianity was the new attachment. The Byzantine world was, in fact, a multi-ethnic empire in which both the imperial leaders and their subjects saw themselves not as ethnocentric Hellens, but primarily as Romans. This was so even under the literate elites who used Greek as a language of letters. A crucial fact ignored by Greek nationalist historiography is that even Justinian's wars aimed at restoring the boundaries of the old Roman Empire, while he himself did not even speak Greek. The important thing is that the resultant of this historically undefendable factoid was the infamous Megali idea, or the great idea, which was to figure very prominently in shaping the Greek Cypriot politics in the 20th century and ultimately create the intractable Cyprus issue. In its most restrained version, in Cyprus it meant the re-establishment of Byzantine Empire, and its broader version it meant the re recreation of the Empire of Alexander the Great. Echoing the words uh, of uh, this approach, Premier Eleftheros Venizelos in 1920, who promised his countrymen a Greece of two continents and five seas, Premier George Papandreou, in a speech delivered in Salonika, said, Cyprus must become the springboard for the dreams of Alexander the Great in Orient. With the rise of nationalism in the 19th and early 20th century among the Greek Cypriots, the Orthodox Church of Cyprus began to function as the most powerful and organized agent of nationalist agitation and mass mobilization. The great idea which constituted the staple of Greek Cypriot education, which was mainly run by the Greek Orthodox Church under the Ottomans, it became the main driving force of Greek Cypriot politics following the British takeover of the island in 1878. Greek Cypriot nationalism reached its zenith by the election of certain Mikhail Muskos as Archbishop of Cyprus, who on the occasion of his enthronement as Makarios III on October 20, 1950, stated, I take the holy oath that I shall work for the birth of our national freedom and shall never waver from our policy of uniting Cyprus with Mother Greece. Greek Cypriot Megali idea and enosis, as formulated by, by Archbishop Makarios, meant the exclusion, subjugation, and when necessary, the elimination of Turkish Cypriot people in order to achieve this ultimate goal. By the time British had granted independence to Cyprus, and the bicommunal partnership Republic of Cyprus was established in 1960, it became abundantly clear that Greek Cypriots considered the new republic a mere stepping stone to annex the island with Greece and forcefully impose its will onto Turkish Cypriot people to create a pure ethnocentric state at the expense of tearing apart the multicultural ethnic fabric of the island. After all, it was Archbishop Makarios, following his election to the presidency of Cyprus this time, declared in a sermon he gave at his native village of Panaya that the struggle of the Greek Cypriot freedom fighters shall not be considered as complete until the last remnants of the enemy of Hellenism, the Turkish Cypriots, were expelled from the island. As tide of Greek Cypriot nationalism grew bigger and stronger, the number of ethnically mixed villages and towns on the island declined. 
Under the Ottomans and under the British, the number of mixed villages were 234. By 1921, the number fell to 221, and the number declined to 200 following Greek Cypriot revolt of 1931, and by the end of the World War II, it dwindled to, to 161. By the time of the establishment of the Bicommunal Republic of Cyprus in 1960, the number was merely 100. By 1974, it was 48, and currently only one mixed village exists on the British base of Dikelia. In 1963, the, Brit uh, the Greek Cypriot leadership dropped all pretenses and began openly declaring its real aim in a public statement, which was widely quoted by the press, Makarios declared, no Greek who knows me can ever believe that I wish to work for the creation of a Cypriot national awareness. The agreements have created a state, but not a nation. The aim of the Cyprus struggle was not the establishment of a republic. These agreements only laid the foundation for the unification of the island with Greece." End of quote. Greek Cypriots exploited the intervening three years between 1960 and 63 to arm themselves and create paramilitary organizations. Millions of dollars channeled by Greece and Greek Orthodox Church is spent on purchasing arms. And by 1963, Makarios declared, Cyprus is Greek. Cyprus was Greek since the dawn of history and will remain Greek. Greek and undivided, we have taken it over. Greek and undivided, we shall preserve it. Greek and undivided, we shall deliver it to Greece. Even today, Makarios' ghost still haunts the Greek Cypriot politics, culture, and education system. After nearly 50 years, the above dictum continues to shape the Greek Cypriot politics and Greek Cypriot thinking vis-a-vis -vis Turkish Cypriots. Whatever is not Greek on the island is second class, and not certainly on par with Greek Cypriots. It is this belief that compels the Greek Cypriots to reject the idea of having a Turkish Cypriot president of Cyprus in a future settlement. Finally, the Greek Cypriot attacks came on December 21st, 1963. In his memoirs, Cyprus, my deposition, Glavkos Kleridis, president of Greek Cypriot state between 1993 and 2003, offers the following analysis of the roots of the Cyprus problem. And I quote, just as the Greek Cypriot preoccupation after the establishment of Republic of Cyprus in 1960 was that Cyprus should be a Greek Cypriot state with a protected Turkish Cypriot minority, the Turkish preoccupation was to defeat any such effort and to maintain the partnership concept, which in their opinion, the Zurich Agreement of 1959 created between the two communities. The conflict, therefore, was a conflict of principle, and that for that principle, both sides were prepared to go on arguing, and even if needed, be to fight rather than compromise." End of quote. The 1963 events that followed was certainly very reminiscent of events that what has happened in Bosnia. As a result of the Greek Cypriot attacks between 21st December 1963 and 18th February 1964, thousands of Turkish Cypriots became refugees, killed, wounded, disappeared. More than 100 Turkish Cypriot villages destroyed, and nearly 75% of Turkish Cypriot population became refugees and forced to live in some 33 small enclaves encircled by Greek Cypriot paramilitary units. As Newsweek correspondent Ward Just described some of them, not much larger than Yankee Stadium in New York. 
Professor Michael Moran calls 1964 as one of the most eventful, indeed fateful year in the history of modern Cyprus. This is indeed a correct and apt analysis for events that took place and the subsequent decisions made in March 1964 in New York, thousands of miles away from Cyprus, sealed the fate of Cyprus and condemned all the future efforts to find a negotiated settlement to Cyprus problem to failure. By February 1964, Turkish Cypriots were driven out of all organs of the state and all Turkish Cypriot members of the parliament, judges, bureaucrats, and ministers were excluded from their offices by force of arms. And before I get into what has happened on March 1964, let me a little bit give information about a visit of a prominent American to Cyprus at that time. On February 12th, George Ball, the United States Under Secretary of State, arrived in Nicosia in an attempt to stop the massacre of the Turkish Cypriots and persuade the Greek Cypriots to accept the stationing of a NATO peacekeeping force in Cyprus. His meeting with Archbishop Makarios proved futile. The much exasperated American diplomat wrote the following in his memoirs, past has another pattern, and I quote from his book. Three or four weeknights of my Cyprus days stand out sharply in my memory, he says. A massacre took place in Limassol on the south coast in which, as I recall, about 50 Turkish Cypriots were killed, in some cases by bulldozers crashing their flimsy houses. As Makarios and I walked out of the meeting together on the second day, I said to him sharply that such beastly actions had to stop, that the previous night's affair was intolerable, and that he must hold the violence with violence. With amused tolerance, he replied, but Mr. Secretary, he said, the Greeks and Turks have lived together for 2,000 years, thousands of years on this island, and there have always been occasional incidents. We are quite used to this. I was furious at such a blunt reply. You're better it, I said. I have been trying for the last two days to make the simple point that this is not the Middle Ages, but that latter part of the 20th century. The world is not going to stand idly by and let you turn this beautiful little island into your private abattoir. Instead of the outburst I have expected, he said quietly with a sad smile, Oh, you are a hard man, Mr. Secretary, a very hard man. Makarios' central interest was to block off Turkish intervention so that he and his Greek Cypriots could go on happily massacring Turkish Cypriots. Obviously, we would never permit that. The Greek Cypriots, I wrote, do not want a peacekeeping force. They just want to be left alone to kill Turkish Cypriots, end of quote. By 1964, without its Turkish Cypriot members, all three branches of Cyprus state, namely executive, legislative, and judiciary, became unconstitutional. In effect, Greek Cypriots hijacked the binational Republic of Cyprus and turned it into a purely Greek Cypriot administration purporting to represent the whole of Ireland and its two peoples. At this point, we have to pose and ask, what, hap what happened during that fateful month of March that the Greek Cypriot administration came to be recognized as the government of Cyprus and Turkish Cypriots were divested of their constitutional rights and partnership status. Under Secretary Ball's failed visit to Cyprus between February 12 and 15 was followed by another wave of violent Greek Cypriot attacks. And international press is full of those which I will refrain from quoting. It will take much time. However, towards the end of February, and following the failure of British-sponsored London Conference to end the massacres, it became apparent that the only alternative was to send a UN peacekeeping force to Cyprus. Despite pro-Greek Cypriot Soviet Russia's and other socialist countries' objections, US and the British submitted 
a draft resolution to that effect to the Security Council. The final draft of the resolution 186 submitted to the approval of the Security Council on March 4, 1964, among other things, asked the government of Cyprus to take all additional measures necessary to stop violence and bloodshed in Cyprus and recommended the creation, with the consent of the government of Cyprus, a United Nations peacekeeping force on the island. In other words, not only the perpetrators of carnage in Cyprus was asked to provide for the security of the Turkish Cypriots, but unconstitutional Greek Cypriot administration was recognized as the legitimate government of Cyprus and put in charge on the island. It also indirectly relegated the co-founder and constitutionally equal partner of the Republic, the Turkish Cypriots, to the preposterous position of minority. But what made Turkey and Turkish Cypriots to drop their initial objections to the wording of this fateful resolution? And I think this is very important. Late President Rauf Denktas, who was in New York at that time, and despite Greek Cypriot objections, managed to address the Security Council, albeit in the diminished status of an interested individual, offered the following explanation in his memoirs. And I think this is the key to the whole issue. The Turkish mission and I, he says, objected to the wording of the draft agreement, which eventually became the accepted UN resolution of March 4, 1964, on the ground that Makarios would take full advantage of it. We stalled the passing of, the, of this draft for about a week. American and British diplomats assured us that the word government in this draft meant the constitutional by communal government. It is the Security Council which will interpret this resolution, they said. Don't waste time. It is Turkish Cypriot blood which is flowing in Cyprus, and we are trying to do something about it. We, the Turkish side, were not impressed. So the British and Americans worked through Ankara, complaining that we are wasting time unnecessarily. They assured Ankara that government mentioned in the draft resolution meant and would mean in future the bicommunal government on this assurance Ankara caved in, and the 4th March resolution was passed unanimously. Now, with hindsight, we know that neither Americans nor the British were telling the truth. Their assurances meant absolutely nothing. Contrary to their assertions, the word government in the text of Resolution 186 was perceived by almost everyone to mean the already wholly Greek Cypriot administration and because of this extraordinarily inconsiderate and careless treatment of the Turkish Cypriots by US and the British, to this day, the problem of sovereignty, more correctly, how it should and can be shared once again between the two peoples, is the major problem the UN still has to resolve in Cyprus. UN's and American attempts to resolve this issue by the introduction of so-called element of constructive ambiguity and the principle of virgin birth in the Annan plan failed after the rejection of this peace plan by the Greek Cypriots in 2004. In a short period of time, all UN member states, except Turkey of course, thereafter recognized the Ram Greek Cypriot administration as the government of Cyprus. Britain, as one of the three guarantors of Cyprus, did not even bother to protest or attempt to rectify this situation. According to Professor Clement Dott of University of London, backed by the United States, Britain was in disinclined to antagonize the Greek Cypriots at a time of communist Russia's penetration into the Middle East. Overtures being made by the Greek Cypriot leader Makarios to the Soviet Union suggested a threat to the British military bases on the island. The Americans were afraid that Cyprus could become a Mediterranean Cuba. American fears reached to its zenith on June 5, 1964, 
when U.S. President Johnson, in a blunt and harsh message to Premier Smet Inanu of Turkey, threatened the Turkish government not to intervene in Cyprus and tr trigger a Greco-Turkish war which could undermine the eastern flank of NATO. While this letter managed to dissuade the Turkish government from coming into the assistance of the destitute Turkish Cypriot people, it gave the Greek Cypriot leadership the needed reprieve to consolidate their usurped status as government of Cyprus and destroy some of the remaining Turkish Cypriot enclaves and impose on the rest uh, on the rest an inhuman economic embargo which brought the Turkish Cypriots to the point of starvation. In the hands of Greek Cypriots, Resolution 186 became the most effective political weapon. With this weapon, they managed to render each and every peace initiative ineffective. And with the legacy of this resolution, they managed to become a full member of the European Union. And of course, with this resolution imposed on the Turkish Cypriot people an inhuman social, cultural, and economic embargo which, thanks to the insensitivity, insensitivity of the Western nations, still continue. Realizing its infinite political value, the Greek Cypriot leadership, while preserving the idea of enosis, dropped its enosis rhetoric and seemingly began to emphasize the island's independence. In other words, the maintenance of the status quo created by Resolution 186. In the words of Greek Cypriot American political scientist and uh, pioneer in peace building initiatives, Harry Anastasiou, this subsuming of enosis to the idea of an independent Hellenic Cyprus was in essence a matter of historical contingency and strategy, but not an abandonment of the overall vision and objective of enosis. The logic of this entailed a shift in tactical policy while not moving outside the framework of nationalism." End of quote. Recently, the ugly echo of Resolution 186 has been heard once more. In an answer to Turkish Cypriot objections to unilateral and illegal <coughs> exploitation of natural gas and oil deposits around the island by the Greek Cypriot administration, the U.S. State Department announced on September 29, 2012, that Cyprus has a sovereign right to explore and exploit its natural resources, totally turning a blind eye to the historical as well as legal facts once more that Cyprus has never meant to be Greek Cypriot administration and sovereignty of the island emanated from both peoples. Professor Michael Moran, at the end of his book titled Sovereignty Divided, makes the following concluding remarks. By allowing the UN, guided by its very idiosyncratic Secretary General in 1964, to take charge of the Cyprus problem, Britain and the United States may have hoped to enjoy some short-term short -term gains, yet as anyone acquainted with the subsequent UN debates on Cyprus, will know as time when went on, it became apparent that they had left themselves with a problem considerably increasing in complexity and one peculiarly resistant to any agreed solution. Professor Moran's remarks, unfortunately, proved to be prophetic. And thank you. Yes, I, I, will, I see it very similar in the sense uh, that there are very two distinct and different narratives. If you look at the Palestinian narrative of what has transpired since, say, 1948, 
till today. And if you look at the Israeli historical as well as current narrative that what has happened and what is happening in Palestine and Israel, you will see that they are irreconcilable. Trying to create a single narrative out of these two very different narratives is impossible. Everybody tried, everybody failed. However, as at the beginning of my talk that I mentioned these two Israeli professors, that they look at these two different narratives as a double helix, distinct yet uh, can help to understand the root causes of the problem. One side can learn about the concerns of the other side and views on this issue. And this is exactly correct for Cyprus. Since 1981 or since 1963 or since 1957, uh, whichever history point you choose, two peoples on the island has two very different narratives. It, is, it has become impossible to create a single narrative because they are very different. Of course, like a double helix, like a DNA helix, they overlap from time to time to each other. As I mentioned, under the Ottomans and the British, two peoples lived side by side, they cooperated, they intermingled, they worked for each other, they visited each other. This is where these narratives touch to each other. But basically, like the Palestinian-Israeli narratives, they remain as apart. And trying to put them together and create a single narrative, as in the case of Israel and Palestine, has proven impossible. So what can be done is this. Like the narrative here, which I am sure totally unagreeable to Greek Cypriots or Greeks if we have them among us today or in Cyprus. Nevertheless, and of course their version is unagreeable to me, helps us to see how Turkish Cypriots and of course how Greek Cypriots see the events, how they interpret these events. And perhaps at the end, a certain degree of understanding can emerge from these two very different narratives. At that point, if we can have that kind of an understanding, not accepting, I don't believe that a Greek Cypriot is capable of accepting, or a Turkish Cypriot, accepting the Greek version of Cyprus events, but understanding it, then at that point, perhaps we can, we can move to achieve a solution in Cyprus. And I think it is exactly the same with uh, Israel and Palestinian situation. This is where I see the similarities. Of course, one can also speculate that they had the same empire, the Ottoman Empire, and then the British mandate and the British colonial administration. But um, you know, I think the dif difference, uh, each case has its own differences. Yes, let us first make one thing very clear. The, uh, the, the issue of natural gas and oil deposits is definitely not an issue of sharing. Turkish Cypriot objection to not that issue. The issue is not sharing. The issue is a matter of status and the principle. Cyprus is a common homeland for both Greeks and Turks. Turkish Cypriots have the 50% of sovereignty of Cyprus. The sovereignty of Cyprus emanates from two peoples. One people, whether Turkish or Greek, it doesn't make any difference, cannot arrogate onto itself the guardianship of sovereignty of Cyprus. Therefore, Greek Cypriot sites claim that they are a sovereign country 
and they can exploit these resources unilaterally is unconstitutional and illegal as far as Turkish Cypriots are concerned. We are not asking the Greek Cypriots to give us handouts. But at one point, Turkish Cypriot side submitted a proposal. They said, and this is our still the official uh, position, that natural resources of Cyprus, whether in the sea or on the land, should be shared by two peoples. If it is necessary to start, start the exploitation of natural gas in the sea now, because economically Cypriots, Greeks and Turks need that money, then let us exploit this together. It was the Turkish Cypriot proposal that originally accepted by the American government as well that we should exploit together whatever money we get from that exploitation should be kept in an escrow account that should be used to finance an eventual solution in Cyprus. Because we know that if one day we find a solution to the Cyprus problem, we shall need more than $25 billion to compensate people, to rebuild country, and to build cities, towns, and villages for those people who are going to move. We thought this was a reasonable offer. It was rejected out of hand by Mr. Christofias. I was at that very specific meeting. Um, President Erol gave him a non-paper, since, of course, he could not accept an official paper. He gave him a non-paper. And to be honest, it was so discourteous, he just threw it away. Uh, because Dr. Erol said that this is our proposal about the exploitation of oil. And Downer was shocked. Um, but anyway, it's not whether Mr. Christofias was uh, rude or not. That's not the issue. But the issue is that Greek Cypriot side rejected a proposal that originally was acceptable even to the American government. Then Americans regretted this because then the Greek lobby created such a big fuss to the American administration that on the 29th uh, that I quoted, they said, you know, Cyprus is a sovereign country and has the right to exploit whatever they can. Um, but the thing is, since our proposal to jointly exploit these resources is turned down and rejected, then Turkish Cypriot side, as well as Turkey, decided to do their own exploration. After finishing some deep sea research, we are now drilling in northern Cyprus on the land. We are looking for oil. In two months' time, we shall start getting the first lab results from that drilling. Um, Greek Cypriot side, uh, exploiting the situation or friction, whatever you want to call, between, the, between Turkey and Israel, has approached Israel, trying to get the Israeli government to join them, hoping to get an extra assurance and to the Greek Cypriot, to some Greek Cypriots, perhaps even military assistance from Israel if Turkey decides to intervene militarily in the uh, explore, exploration area. As Turkey said and repeatedly said in the past, uh, and Turkey Cypriot side, we want to have this opportunity, a, a way and means to a peaceful solution of Cyprus problem and not of confrontation. But for Greek Cypriots, this is a matter of sovereignty. And they said they can only give us some money, as if we are asking for some money, if the Turkish army is withdrawn from Cyprus, if Turkish ports are open to uh, Greek Cypriot vessels, and if um, Turkey allows Greek Cypriot planes to fly over Turkey. In other words, if we succumb to the Greek Cypriots and say yes to everything so that we can get some of that money. Believe me, my friend, we are not, us, uh, we are not after a few million dollars. Because of the embargoes and because of our economic situation, we receive from Turkish government $500 million per year. 
So uh, thank you, but no thank you to the Greek Cypriots. Yes. I have a question about the fact that there are uh, still are uh, Turkish and Jews. Uh, there are 40,000 uh, uh, Turkish and Jews. I don't like your opinion about that. Sure, of course. Let me very uh, blatant about it. Turkish Cypriots do not want, and I underline, do not want any armies, Turkish, Greek, British, Japanese, Tanganyikan, for that matter, any troops on the island. End of it. We simply don't want to see any soldiers on Cyprus. But what can we do? Who is going to provide security for the Turkish Cypriots? Between 1964, we talked about Resolution 186 and created UNFISIP, the UN Peacekeeping Forces. Between 1964 and 74, for 10 years, there were no single Turkish troops on the island. Yet, there was no solution. So Turkish troops are not stopping anyone from reaching a solution. Turkish troops are there to provide security for the Turkish Cypriots. Annan plan provided a timetable. I happened to be sitting at that table when we drew up the final schedule for withdrawal of Turkish troops. By now, there would have been not a single Turkish soldier in Cyprus. Actually, by 2005, most of it would have gone. So as Turkish Cypriots, we do not want any armies on Cyprus. Turkish, Greek, you name it. We don't even want an army for Cyprus, a future Cyprus. Cyprus should be an island of peace, an example to other uh, regions like Israel and Palestinians, to Sudanese people, to other, other peoples in the world. But for 11 years, for 10 years, UN troops stayed on Cyprus. They are still there but did not and could not provide security for Turkish Cypriots. It was during the UN presence that hundreds and thousands of Turkish Cypriots were wounded, killed, and disappeared. All these villages were destroyed. All they did was to sit down, take photographs, and produce very nice reports. One is the famous Ortega report, around 780 pages, with around 300 photographs. So, for Turkish Cypriots, our basic existence depends on Turkish troops. We want to keep them until as such that we reach an agreement and finish the Cyprus question. But believe me, it is not that we love to have glorious Turkish army in, in our streets or in our fields or in, 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 in anywhere. Armies should stay wherever they originate from. In this case, Turkish army in Turkey, Greek army in Greece, um, and UN troops, which are from Ireland or from Australia or from Argentina, should go back to their own country. But it was not Turkish Cypriots who conspired with Turkey to bring in the Turkish army. It was the Greek Cypriots who, in order to realize their uh, dream, finally not only slaughtered the Turkish Cypriots, but finally attempted to kill their own leader, Makarios, and uh, slaughter their own brothers, that finally Turkish army had to intervene in Cyprus in accordance with the Treaty of Guarantee, mind you. 